Good morning. Our scripture is in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth, in your heart, so that you can do it. This is the word of the Lord. A little bit better. You want to try it again? This is the word of the Lord. Well done. Well done. You know what? Baby steps. We're working our way up. Um, man, I, I'm so excited to be able to preach to you this morning. I'm going to say at the very outset, this one's going to be different. It's going to feel different. And in a lot of ways, this whole series has felt different because it's a series about the Bible. Usually we just preach through books of the Bible and um, we're almost done. We have two weeks left in this and then we're going to be back in the Bible in the book of James, which I'm really excited about. Today, um, if, you, if you haven't been with us, we're picking up where we've left off and we're really going over uh, a theology of the Bible. And, and if you're new to the Christian faith or maybe you've been here for a while and you, you might not even be, be familiar with bibliology or, or the, the technical uh, doctrines of Scripture. We've talked about already the veracity of Scripture and the authority of Scripture. And, and today we're going to be talking about the clarity of Scripture. And, and maybe you've never thought about these things in like a technical way before, but I guarantee you've thought about them in your life. And what you think about these doctrines is going to have a massive impact on the way you live. The clarity of the Bible is another way of talking about the knowability of the Bible. It's the idea that you can actually open it up and make sense of it, that there's meaning in it, and you can understand the meaning. And what we believe about the clarity of the Bible is absolutely vital because it's going to determine how you approach it. Even more than that, it's going to determine whether or not you approach it at all. I can't tell you how many times I've heard believers say, man, I want to read the Bible, but that doesn't make any sense. And so then they don't pick up the Bible and read the Bible because it's not clear, it's not knowable, it's hard to understand. But if you believe that the Bible is understandable, you'll read it. If you believe that there is clear meaning in the text, and that if you look hard enough, you'll find it, then you'll search it out. If you believe that it's the revelation of God, and not just a God, but the God who loves you and wants you to know him and enjoy him, then you'll seek his face in it. But if you don't believe those things, then reading it will be nothing more than an exercise in futility. And so what you believe about this doctrine, the clarity of Scripture, is absolutely foundational to your life. It will either drive you to God or it will drive you away from God. And we have to talk about this today because a lot of Americans do not believe in the clarity of Scripture. And, and I would say that that skepticism has made its way into our church as, as well. Um, many people are skeptical of the Bible, and their skepticism, um, it, it flows into the church in, I would say, one of three main ways. And, and I'm going to tell you again at the outset, um, this is going to be a little bit long. It's going to be, that's okay. I was like, it sounded not like normal, and I was like, what is that? That's a, that's a really loud dragonfly. Like, what is that? <laughs> That was a baby. Okay, sorry, that just really started on me. <laughs> okay, all right, back to it. Um, anyways, so the, the skepticism shows up in one of three main ways, and I'll say again, this is going to feel technical. Um, it's a technical doctrine, but I, I know it's going to encourage you and challenge you, and hopefully it'll motivate you to open it up your book. So, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do a couple of things here. I'm going to show you these main skepticisms, the, these main forms of skepticism that have kind of infiltrated our church and, um, and have impacted the way that you think about the clarity of the Bible. Then I'm going to kind of pick them apart a little bit, and then I'm going to show you why the Bible is clear and how we can find meaning in it. It's going to all make sense in the end. First, 
Let's look at these uh, skepticisms that have kind of made their way into the church. I think there are three of them. See if any of them have, have impacted the way you think about the Bible. The first one is what you could call a mystical skepticism. A mystical skepticism basically views God as so transcendent and so other and so big that he can't be described in human language. That the moment we try to put words to a transcendent God and we try to describe him and define him in clear theological categories is the moment that we put him in a box. And the moment that you put God in a box is the moment that you don't have God anymore. And so the Bible is nothing more than man's feeble attempt to take the transcendent and put it into human language. But as soon as they do that, it falls short and it's a waste of time. This is the mystical skepticism. Rob Bell, who uh, used to be an evangelical pastor, now he's a universalist. He works with Oprah and does all kinds of other things. He, He put it like this in his old book, Velvet Elvis, which was super cool when I was in college. He said, the moment God is figured out with nice, neat lines and definitions, we are no longer dealing with God. In other words, the moment you try to understand God and you try to describe him in any kind of meaningful way, the moment you say, this is what God is like, is the moment you don't have God anymore. Who are we to be able to say that we understand God? Isn't that pretty arrogant that we could say we understand God? And so this idea of mysticism or this skepticism is, it's almost like humility, Um, In this view, maturity is growing in our humility, but not in like a biblical humility. It's a humility that basically says, instead of growing in our knowledge of God, let's grow in our acceptance that we can't know him. That's what maturity looks like. I think the best picture of how this view plays out is the parable of the elephant and the five blind men. You know this this story? I, I tried to find an image. Let's see if it works, Tim. Yeah, there it goes. So there's this parable. It goes all the way back to like 500 BC. It shows up in, in Buddhism and some of the um, Hindu writings. And basically, there's five blind men. They've never heard of an elephant before, but they, they just so happen to stumble upon an elephant, and they can't see. And they're all at different parts of the ele- elephant, and they're, they're just you know fumbling around in the dark trying to feel their way. And the first guy grabs the trunk, and he's like, oh, it's like a giant snake. And then the guy, you know, next to him is like, no, and he feels the ear, and he's like, no, it's, it's like a big fan, and, and on and on it goes. The, the guy in the belly is like, no, it's a giant wall, and then the tusks are like, it's a spear, and, and the tail is like, it's a rope. And so they all have these subjective ideas. They're partial. It's based on what they can feel, but they're blind, so they can't see the full picture. And the idea is that none of them are right. And that's what it's like to be a human trying to deal with God. We're all basically blind, fumbling around in the darkness, trying to make sense of it. And and we might have a piece of it over here, and we might have a piece of it over here. Like, you could look at nature and say, wow, he's really creative. He's really powerful. He's a God of order, and you can do all of those kinds of things. But that's not really him. And, and, And then you could look at, like, the way that you love your kids, maybe. And you could think, wow, there must be something of love in him, because why do I love him like that? And you can come to some ideas, but even that's not really like him either. And so this idea is that true humility is owning the fact that you're blind and you're nothing more than blind and you can't know the God who created you. That's the mystical skepticism. Now let me ask you a question to go back to that analogy. What if the elephant could talk? Wouldn't that change some things? Like, even more importantly than that, what if he could talk and he wanted the blind men to know who he was and what he was? And so they're fumbling around in the darkness saying things like it's a rope and it's a spear and and he would chime in and correct him. He's like, no, 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 I'm an elephant. And then the other guy's like, no, I'm pretty sure you're a fan. And, And he's like, no, that's just my ear. You're still wrong. I'm an elephant. And on and on it goes. And every time they give an idea, the elephant speaks because he can talk and he He tells them what he actually is. Wouldn't that change the analogy? Of course it would. If the elephant could talk, everything changes. And so the mystical view becomes less about being humble and more about being hard of hearing. Yeah, there are all kinds of mysteries wrapped up in God. No, we cannot know him exhaustively. 
No, we cannot know him comprehensively or completely, which means we'll never arrive at a point where we say, I figured him out. There's nothing else to learn. I've plumbed the depths of God. I finally reached the bottom. There is no bottom with God. We'll never get to that point, which by the way, just a side note, that's going to be one of the greatest thrills of heaven. I know a lot of people are like uh, terrified of heaven because they're like, what am I going to do for all eternity? It's just going to be so boring. Um, and, and you're like, I'm just going to be playing a harp in some room with a bunch of other people playing harps for millions and billions and trillions of years. Like, I don't want to go to heaven. Um, and and, and this we don't understand about heaven is that, um, do you know why kids love life so much? Do you know why there's so much awe and wonder and happiness and joy and everything is magic for kids? It's because every single day for a kid, they're experiencing something for the first time. There's something new that they discover and explore. So like when I watch my three-year-old get in, get in the horse trough that we've turned into a pool, okay, which I've told you about several times, the joy and the wonder and the thrill of that horse trough, the water comes up to like right here, okay? But you would think that she was like swimming in the Niagara or like with dolphins, I, they're not there. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and she's constantly finding new things. And so she's constantly wanting to show us new things. And it's the most annoying thing in the world. Dad, look at this. Dad, look at this. Except she doesn't say, Dad, look at this. She said, how about this? How about this? How about this? And then she'll like hold the edge of the pool and do her little foot like that. And she's like, did you see that? <laughs> We're like, this is not that cool. Um, but this is the reason that kids love life so much. It's because every day there's a new adventure. There's a new discovery. Guys, that's what heaven's going to be like for us. Every single day, there's going to be a new adventure and a new discovery. Since God is infinite, and he's infinitely great and infinitely glorious and infinitely beautiful, every single day, we're going to see something new about him, and it's going to blow our minds. And it's going to be like, I cannot believe that. And we're going to tell all of our friends, and we're going to join in community, which adds to the joy, because community is what we were made for. And we're just going to, that's what worship looks like. We're not going to be playing harps. We're going to be exploring the new heavens and the new earth and the God who made it, and we're going to learn something new every single day. And we're never going to get to the point where we say, there's nothing else. Every single day. Isn't that cool? Okay, so that's a side point. My point here, as it relates to the Bible, is that, God is infinite, and so we can't know him completely. But what I want you to see is that even though we can't know him ex exhaustively, he can be known truthfully. He can be known rightly, correctly. You can say something about God that is true, even if it isn't totally complete. So you can say something like, God is love, and understand it, and it's a true statement, and for all eternity, grow in your understanding of what that means. That makes sense, right? So from one degree of glory to the next, for all eternity, we're going to be pursuing him and enjoying him. It'll never stop. We can describe God in a truthful way because God has described himself to us. We can talk about who he is and what he's like in our own language because he revealed himself to us in our human language. Do you know what Jesus is called in John 1? The Word. In the beginning, God, or the Word, was with God, and he, was, and he was God, and he spoke all of creation into existence, and then that Word took on flesh and dwelt among us so that he could show us what God is like. And Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You have seen God. God loved us so much that even though we were blind and we were fumbling around in the dark, he didn't leave us there. He spoke. As Psalm 18 says, You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Jesus says in John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Guys, Cheryl just read Deuteronomy 30. Right before that, Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed 
belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. In other words, there are secret things about God, and they belong to him, and we can't grasp them, but there are some things that he has revealed to us, and those things can be known. They can be on our lips, and we can obey them. Deuteronomy 30 says the same exact thing. It's not too high. It's not too far. You don't need to say, oh, it's in heaven and I can't get there. No, it can be on your lips. It can be on your heart and you can do it. So we know him not completely, but we know him truthfully because he's revealed himself to us. The elephant has spoken. God has made himself known. So another, that's the first, uh, um, I guess, type of skepticism is mystical. The second type of skepticism is Catholic. When I say Catholic, I'm talking about Catholic proper, like the Roman Catholic Church. And this version of of skepticism related to the clarity of Scripture um, says that the Bible is clear, but it's not clear enough for normal people. It's not clear enough for the average person on the street to be able to pick it up and understand it. You need a magisterium, you need a bishop, or you need a pope to explain it to you. In some parts, it's actually incomplete, and so the Pope needs to fill in the gaps and make it make sense for us, tell us what it means. In other words, only the professionals can make sense of the Bible. This is the skepticism of the Roman Catholic Church. Only the people with training, only the people with seminary, only the people who know Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic can interpret the Bible correctly. And so the Reformation of the Catholic Church was necessary because the Catholic Church refused to translate the Bible in the language of the people and the common people. It was in Latin. And at least in the UK, they didn't speak Latin. They spoke English. And so the Bible had to be kept out of English because if the plowman got it, he might come up with an, come up with an interpretation that was wrong And then the baker might come up with a different one, and the butcher, another one, and the seamstress, another one. And there would be all of these different interpretations from all of these people who couldn't make sense of it, and it would lead to chaos and confusion. And so it it couldn't be translated into English, and so the Catholic Church had to protect the people from themselves and keep it in Latin. The religious elite literally kept the people in darkness so that they could maintain power over them. Then the Reformation came along, and literally everything changed. Men like William Tyndale. William Tyndale was convinced that people needed the Bible in their own language. And even though he was called a heretic, and even though it would lead to his execution and and burning at the stake, he said, before I die, if God allows me, I am translating this book into English. And there was one, there's one scene where he's sitting at the dining room table with one of the, the bishops in his area. And the bishop's telling him, like, you got to stop, you got to stop. And William Tyndale looks at him and he's like, listen, my goal, if God allows it, is that the plowman outside will know more of this book than you ever have. That was his vision. That was the vision of the Reformation. And so William Tyndale translated that book from Greek and Hebrew into English so that the plowman could have it. And he died as a result of it. But everything changed. When he did it, he believed that the Bible was powerful and was understandable. He believed that it was for the educated and for everyone else. And doing that, the course of human history was changed forever. Guys, did you know that it was because of the translation of the Bible that the age of superstition was ended and the age of discovery was launched? Did you know that the Middle Ages transition to the Renaissance because of the publishing and the mass distribution of the English Bible? Because people could read it for themselves and they could make sense of it for themselves. The Reformation happened because the Bible was clear enough for the common people to understand it. They didn't need a magisterium. They didn't need a pope. They didn't need a bishop to tell them what it meant. All they had to do was read it for themselves. Now, this is really significant for us today because even though we're not Catholics, uh, we don't say we need a pope, which is a good thing because the pope is, is totally throwing out scripture today. Um, and that's another sermon, I suppose. Um, more often than not, though, even though we say we don't need a pope, did, 
You, you act like you do. We act like we do. Who's allowed to teach the Bible in your mind? <laughs> I've had this conversation a lot in the last two years. Who's allowed to teach the Bible? Oh, it's the person who went to seminary. Who's allowed to lead the Bible study? It's the person who can articulate the doctrines of grace and quote Calvin and Luther. Who's allowed to disciple other people? It's the person who's, I don't know, read the works of Keller or, or Piper or whatever it is, who, who it is that you like. Listen, we say we believe in the clarity of Scripture, but we act like it's clouded. And I know this is true. We say we don't need a pope, but we depend on professionals um, because I cannot tell you how many times people have come to me and they've held out their Bible and said, make this make sense for me. I'm happy to do it. I love to do it. In fact, part of my job as a shepherd is to feed the sheep. That, this is the greatest joy of my life. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm feeding the sheep. This is great. Uh, Jesus is walking with Peter after his resurrection. He's calling into pastoral ministry, and it's not to a platform, and it's not to fame, and it's not to a book deal. He just says, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, and then you're going to get hung up on a cross. That's the call to pastoral ministry. So I love feeding the sheep, and yet at the same time, it breaks my heart because I know what's being communicated to me is a belief that you can't make sense of it on your own. You don't believe in the clarity of the Bible. And so in those moments, I'm happy to feed, but more importantly, I'm happy to teach you how to feed yourself. Teach you how to feast on the word of God so that you don't need me. You don't need a pope. You don't need a pastor. You can open it up and hear from him yourself. Finally, the last example of skepticism. This is the intro. We're going to get into it in a minute. The last example of skepticism is... Um, is pluralism. And I would say that this is the most significant one of our day. I would say that this one is the most dangerous because it rings the most true to our postmodern sensibilities as Americans. This is basically what it does. See if, if you don't see this in yourself. There are so many interpretations on so many different things, especially the secondary things. There are so many different denominations. There's so many splits and so many views in Christianity today. How in the world could the Bible be clear if nobody can agree on anything? It's pluralism. How can there be cessationists and continuationists? How can there be Calvinists and Arminians? How can there be complementarians and egalitarians? And on and on and on the list goes. Dispensationalists and covenantalists and, you know, all of the fun stuff. Guys, every single week I get up in front of you and I preach my heart out. And sometimes I yell. Sometimes I cry. And if I'm really serious, I whisper. <laughs> and I'm like convinced. And I'm full of passion and certainty that what I'm telling you is what the Bible says. And yet, if you leave here and you drive down South Boulevard, you're going to pass five churches that are going to say something different than me. How do I know I'm right? How do you know I'm right? You know what I mean? This is a big question. They're just as passionate. They might not cry as much, but they might whisper every once in a while. Just as certain that what they're saying is true. And so the question is, what are we supposed to do with that? How does this make any sense? How does it not make everything I'm telling you nothing more than my opinion? How do I not know that we're just in an echo chamber right now and you chose to come to this church because I'm telling you what you already believe? These are good questions, by the way. They're important questions. But that's not the only problem. The, the pluralistic skepticism doesn't just point out all the differences in Christianity. It also points out all of the times that we've gotten it wrong in the last 2,000 years. So not only are there tons of different views and all kinds of differences, but for the last 2,000 years, we've interpreted Scripture in ways that have justified evil. Like you look at a guy like Martin Luther, a great reformer of the Catholic Church, we sing his songs to this day, a mighty fortress is our God, and yet he read scripture and used it to justify anti-Semitism. 
That's wrong. Because then later on, he was a German, later on Hitler came along and he used Martin Luther's writings to justify the final solution. That's messed up. He was wrong and it was misused. Slavery, misogyny, anti-Semitism, the Crusades, on and on it goes. And so the pluralistic question for you and me today is, how do you know you're not getting it wrong today? There are countless examples of disagreements and countless examples of error. Wouldn't it be better just to not take a position on anything? Wouldn't that be safer? To just question everything? Wouldn't it be wiser to hold everything with an open hand and never arrive at a point of certainty about anything? This is the kind of skepticism that is in the process of ransacking the church in America right now. This is the kind of skepticism that is in the process of shipwrecking countless people's faith right now. And if you don't answer this question, it will shipwreck your faith too. And so what are we supposed to do with these questions? There are a lot of answers. I would say the best and the safest and the wisest place to start is always with Jesus himself. You see, Jesus was constantly teaching and preaching and quoting scripture. And at the same time, the crowds were constantly mishearing him and misinterpreting him and misunderstanding what he was saying. And yet what's so important for us to see about Jesus, and I'm going to show you a lot of these examples is that he never takes the blame for the misuse. He never takes the blame for the misunderstanding and the misinterpretation. He never apologizes for being unclear. In fact, he never concedes that the people's lack of understanding is the scripture's fault. He always confronts some fault in his audience and says, if you're not getting it, it's because of something in you. He calls them out for things like traditionalism and dullness, and blindness, and pride, and foolishness, and even stubbornness, and sin. In other words, Jesus would say, it's not the scriptures that are muddled, it's you. It's not the scriptures that are clouded, it's your heart, and it's your mind that's messed up. For example, let me just give you a bunch of these. Matthew 13, 15, this is Jesus. The people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. I should have these texts. Matthew 16, 11, Do you still not perceive? How is it that you still not under, don't understand that I'm not talking about bread? Mark 7, 13, You make void the word of God by your, get this, tradition that you've handed down. What makes void the word of God? Is it, is it not clear? No, it's not that it's not clear. It's that we bring our tradition into it. Luke 24. O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? In other words, guys, the prophets spoke this stuff. You have the prophets. You should have understood it, but you didn't because you're foolish. It's not their fault. They were clear. It's, it's something in you. John 3. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The people loved darkness rather than the light. We loved the blindness. And so the elephant's speaking to us. God's revealing himself to us. And we're like, no, I don't want to hear it. I want to think you're a fan. Because if you're a fan and not an elephant, I get to do whatever I want. They loved the darkness. And so they rejected the light. John 5. It's the scriptures that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The scriptures are clear. They bear witness about me. You just refuse them. John 8, finally, last one. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. Guys, Jesus never blamed the word of God for being unclear or confusing or obscure. Instead, he always pointed to traditionalism and dullness and blindness and foolishness and stubbornness and sin in the hearts and the minds of his listeners. And so the point is, when we are going to the scripture, it's clear 
but our hearts aren't and our minds aren't. And so there's a risk there. This means I might disagree with you about spiritual gifts. And I I might disagree with you, not because of what I'm seeing in the text, but because I'm stubborn and I'm stuck in my tradition. I'm not from a charismatic tradition. I'm from a cessationist tradition. I told church membership a couple months ago that um, the only time growing up, the only time I ever saw uh, people raising their hands, the only time I ever heard about anybody charismatic, there was one time I was like a junior high or sixth grade or whatever. And, and we're like a, a frozen chosen church. We're just, you know, we're happy, but we're not, you know. And, um, and I'll, I'll never forget, there were two guys in the center, front and center. And the whole time we were singing, they were like this. And, and it was, I was, I'd never seen it before in my life. I was like, what are, who are those crazy people? And I was so distracted, I watched them the whole time. As soon as we got home, I was like, dad, did you see those crazy people? Like, what were they doing? And I'd never heard the word charismatic before in my life. And my dad said, oh yeah, those are charismatics. <laughs> so in my mind, I'm like, okay, don't be like that. Don't do that. I didn't know anything about charismatic theology or the gifts or anything. I just knew they raised their hands in worship. So I went through seminary. I had, I had to write my position paper on spiritual gifts. What do I think about them? And, and I, I had my, all my books. And, and my favorite book when it comes to like interpreting scriptures is, is a series called Four Views. And, and it's people who are evangelical and, they're, and they're, they're, they're saved. Let's just call them that. We're all going to be in heaven together. But they interpret scripture differently. And so there would be a view on cessationism and there would be a view on like just Pentecostalism and open but cautious and all this kind of stuff. I went to those books because of my stubbornness and because of my tradition, and I didn't read the other views. I just read my view so that I could get my proof texts, so that I could write a paper based on what I wanted to believe, not based on what the text said. So now I'm well into ministry, and I would say it was probably about three years ago, it hit me. I was like, what if I'm wrong? And I was like, what if I've just carried my tradition with me and I haven't given it a second thought? And so when we landed in Charlotte about, I guess it was five years ago now. Wow, time's flying by. COVID screwed it up, man. Wow. Five years ago. (laughs) I told Caroline, I was like, we're going to a charismatic church and we're just going to deconstruct, like not my faith, but I want to just like be in a different church. And all we sang was Bethel and we were healing people and, and people were pumped and they were face down on the front row. And, and I was just like, what is true? What is biblical? And what is my tradition? And, where, where? and I'm still in this process of learning and growing. And then I met some guys in this church that have come and we've sat around fires. And I love it. The first question is always like, what do you think about spiritual gifts? And, um, and my first response is, what do you think about it? <laughs> I want you to tell me what you think. Um, I want to hear your experience. I want to know how you read these passages because I'm in process right now. I might disagree with you about the end times, but maybe, just maybe, it's because I'm ignorant or maybe I'm naive. You might disagree with me about God's work in salvation because you're too proud. You might disagree with me about some ethical requirement or command because you're afraid of what people will think or you just don't want to give up your sin. The point is this. The problem of interpretation and understanding is on you and it's on me. It is not on God and it's not on his word. It's clear. The reason we have so many disagreements is because we've got so much baggage. All throughout scripture, there is an expectation that we can know the word of God and that in knowing we can obey it. And in obeying, we can have life. It makes wise the simple. Psalm 19, it leads to everlasting life. John 20, it's profitable for correction and reproof. 2 Timothy 3, wherever it goes, it accomplishes what it sets out to do. Isaiah 55, over and over and over again throughout Scripture, we see examples of the clarity and the knowability of the Word of God, even when it comes to secondary things. Can I tell you a fun story about Jesus? I know you're so nervous because we're still in the intro. Um, (laughs) Matthew 19. 
Pharisees come up to Jesus because they want to test him. They want to put him on the spot. They want to try to get him to make a mistake. And so they ask him a question about a secondary issue that's debatable in their culture, and it's the issue of divorce. And so they come up and they're like, hey, what do you think? Do you think that it's lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Now, this is so fascinating as a case study for us and what we're supposed to do about secondary issues and debatable things as it relates to scripture. Because in that culture, there were a lot of different views about divorce. One view believed that it was never okay. One believed it was okay on extreme circumstances. And one believed that it was okay on a lot of different circumstances. And you can see they're trying to trip up Jesus. Do you know what Jesus does not say to these people? He doesn't just say, well, let's just leave it up for interpretation. You know what? You do you and you do you and you do you. It's all okay. Agree to disagree. He doesn't do that. You know what he says? Even though there's all kinds of disagreement and different interpretations, he says in verse 4, and and we're not going to go there. This is another sermon probably. He says in verse 4, have you not read? And then he goes back to Genesis. So how does he answer the debatable thing? How does he deal with the secondary issue that lots of different groups have views on it? He answers it by going to Scripture. And he says, have you not read? This is a case study for us. In other words, there's a right answer to the question, and the right answer is in the text of Scripture. The reason there's a debate isn't because there isn't an answer in the Bible. It's because we haven't read it correctly yet. Are you following me, guys? Okay. Now, the big question becomes, if the Bible is clear, sorry, this this cord is driving me nuts. Um, Just fix this real quick. Okay. The big question now becomes, if the Bible is clear, and we're the ones who are muddled, how are we ever supposed to study it? And how are we ever to hope that one day we'll arrive at the correct interpretation? How are we supposed to know if we're on the right side, if we haven't been blinded by our tradition, or pride, or group, or, or whatever? How am I supposed to stand up in front of you and say, this is what the Bible says with any level of certainty? In other words, if there's clear meaning in the text, how are we supposed to find it? Now, there are six principles that I'm going to show you. We're getting into the sermon But before you get nervous, I'm not going to show you all of them today. We're just going to do three. And you're like, no. Next week, we're going to talk about the practice of the word. We're going to put it all together, and I'm going to show you how to do it every day. How do we we just make it all real and practical in your life? Um, I'm going to show you three things today. I think they're really important first. Our interpretation must be based on the author's intended meaning and not our own. Which means that when we approach the scriptures, our first question should not be, what does this passage mean to me? Small groups are like, this is kind of like the the basic question of small groups. I know you have been in a group where you have asked this question. I have been in a group where I have asked this question. It is not the right question. The first question that you and I should ask when approaching the scriptures is not, what does this mean to me? It is, what did this mean to the author? What did this mean to the person who was inspired by God to put pen to paper and write it down? Most of our bad interpretations are actually the result of mixing up those two questions. Putting ourselves at the center, reading ourselves into the text instead of letting the text read us and form us. We can't assume that if we think it means something, that the author is on the same page. For example, in the early 1960s, uh, there was this folk group called Peter, Paul, and Mary. So biblical. Um, They had a really famous song called Puff the Magic Dragon. Anybody know this song? You heard this song? Oh, yeah. Doug in the back. (laughs) Now, in the 60s, drug use is on the rise, as you know, I'm sure. Um, especially in artist communities. A lot of people believe that this song was about smoking marijuana. 
And so the magic dragon was supposedly a reference to weed and to puff. The magic dragon was essentially like lighting up and smoking a joint. And this is what the song was about. It was like the anthem of the 60s, (laughs) Puff the Magic Dragon. Um, And it became famous. Then 30 years later, Peter, Paul, and Mary got back together. They did a reunion tour. Everybody cannot wait for Puff. They got their stuff ready to go, and it's going to be epic. And, and before they sing the song at the very end of the show, Peter gets up to the mic and he's like, listen, I need to tell you something. This song is not about marijuana. The magic dragon is not what you think it is, and puffing on it is not what you think it is either. In fact, it's just a song about a little boy who has a pet dragon, and he's growing up, and he's leaving childhood, and he's really sad about it. And I know because Puff is my son. And everyone was like, what? (laughs) Guys, it's one thing to do this with a folk song. You know, you can read whatever you want into music or paintings. You stand in front of the painting, and you're like, this means this to me, and it's art, you know, and it's subjective, and and that's kind of cool. Um, It's another thing to do it with the authoritative word of God. It's dangerous. And so we need to do the hard work to find the author's intended meaning. Now listen, sometimes the work is easy. Sometimes it just jumps off the page and it smacks you in the face and you're like, oh, that that makes sense. And then sometimes it's a process and it's more difficult and it takes work. A perfect example of this for me in my own life is Psalm 42. Psalm 42 is a psalm that I love. It's a psalm that I've read countless times. And, and I read it again a couple of weeks ago when I was at the beach with my family on vacation. Um, it's one of those psalms that is really easy to interpret. And the meaning jumps off the page and it smacks you in the face. Just to give you a summary, the sons of Korah are writing it. The song is literally, literally called, Why So Downcast, O My Soul. It's a song about depression. It's a song about enemies taking over this person, and the person's like, why am I so downcast? Why am I so distraught? Why am I so depressed? And then he says, I'm going to put my hope in God. And and so the meaning is is pretty obvious. My favorite lines are verses 5 through 7. I'm going to show you this, and then I'm going to blow your mind. It says, and I'll show you them. I'll show them to you, and then I'll show you. Sorry, that that wasn't it. (laughs) I was just reading my own words, and my bad. Okay, here it is. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep, and the roar of the waterfalls. All of your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Okay, now, those three verses... um, are a perfect example of both meaning that is easy and obvious and also meaning that is hidden and deep and hard to find. It's easy enough for the person off the street without any background of the Bible to read it and understand it, and at the same time, there is so much historical and theological complexity in those three verses that you need one of the most robust scholars of Hebrew to write a book about it and explain it to you so you can understand. So this is my story I want to tell you. It's going to blow your mind. I just so happened to read this book providentially. A couple of weeks ago, before going to the beach, I read a book called um, Reversing Herman. I don't know why I couldn't remember that name in the moment. Reversing Herman. It's by a guy named Michael Heiser. Michael Heiser is a stout Hebrew theologian, ancient history scholar, written all kinds of books. I've been reading them a lot recently, and they're, they're blowing my mind, changing my life. I've just finished this book. It's called Reversing Herman, okay? Now, I read this book And then I'm at the beach, and I'm just like, you know what, I'm going to read Psalm 42 again because I love this psalm. And and I was thinking about deep calling to deep and the breakers and the ocean just crashing over me. And I'm like, I'm watching the ocean. I'm going to read Psalm 42, and I'm just going to, like, drown in it. It's going to be amazing. And I get to verse 6, and and it says, Jordan and Hermon and Mizar. You see that? From the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Now, up until two weeks ago, I would tell you I knew what this passage was about. But as far as I knew, those names and those places meant nothing. They were insignificant. And so I'd read verse 5, and I'd skip over verse seven, 6, and I'd get to verse 7. 
Because those names and places are, again, they don't really add anything to the meaning. Just shrug my shoulders. Have you ever done that before? When you're reading the Old Testament especially and you see a name or a place or a river or a valley and you're just like, eh, I guess someone knows what that means. And you just like move on, you know? That was me in, in, this, in this passage. Okay, so a couple weeks ago I, I read Reversing Hermon. It's all about a mountain in ancient Mesopotamia called Mount Hermon. Just so happens to be the mountain that the sons of Korah are referencing in Psalm 42. I'm not going to be able to give you even a nutshell of this book um, because there's too much in it. But long story short, that mountain has massive spiritual meaning. It's insane. I'll, I'll try to give you a nutshell. The implications are like so far reaching. They go all the way from Genesis 6 to Revelation. This mountain is part of the major storyline of Scripture. Jesus came to reverse Hermon. I can't, ugh, okay. When Jesus is on earth, he shows up and his teaching and his miracles and he's doing all of these things to demonstrate that he's the son of God and that he is, he is the chosen one, the Messiah who's come to save the world. Um, the most powerful, maybe the most, I would say it's the most, the most powerful moment of his ministry, you know what it was? It's his transfiguration. His transfiguration, he takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain, and he pulls the curtain back, and he shows him his glory. And the disciples fall on their faces in terror, and then Moses shows up, and Elijah shows up, and, and, and he says, don't be afraid, stand up. And Peter's like, should we eat? You know, because Peter's always trying to make an awkward moment not awkward. And, 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 and they're doing all of this stuff, and they see the glory of God. Do you know what mountain they're on? It's Mount Hermon. But this is what's so significant. Jesus isn't just revealing himself to his disciples. He's actually declaring war on the unseen realm. He's declaring war on the lesser gods, the evil powers, the principalities, and the rulers of the world. Because do you know what Mount Hermon was? It was the mountain of the gods. Listen to this. At the base of Mount Hermon was a city called Caesarea Philippi. You might recognize this from reading the New Testament. Caesarea Philippi was the epicenter for Baal worship. Baal, you might remember from our study in Daniel, was the serpent from Eden. Baal is the devil himself. The epicenter of devil worship in ancient Mesopotamia is Caesarea Philippi. It's right next to Mount Hermon. They believed the gods lived in that mountain, and they would do all kinds of wicked and evil sacrifices to appease the gods. But at the base of Mount Hermon was a cave. And that cave was believed to be the door to the underworld. And, and so it was literally called the gate of hell. That you would go into this gate and you would be in the, into the underworld where all of these evil principalities and rulers were ruling and it's all related to Hermon. Do you know what happens right before Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up Mount Hermon? He says, Peter, I'm going to call you rock, and I'm going to build my church on you, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. He is declaring war. He says, I'm building my church, and I am putting it right here on this rock, this mountain, the mountain of the gods. And then he pulls the curtain back, and he isn't just showing the disciples who he is. He's showing all of that unseen realm. I'm here. Get ready. It's about to go down. So I'm reading this book. That's, that's not even a nutshell, guys. It's not even a nutshell. It's wild. Um, so I've just read this book, and now, and now I'm reading Psalm 42, a psalm that I understand, a psalm that's easy. The meaning just jumps off the page, and I see Mount Hermon, and I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And in my Bible, there's a cross-reference, and it shows the first time Hermon shows up, and it goes back to Genesis 6, and then there's another cross-reference to Deuteronomy 3, and it all connects. And what David is saying here, sorry, not David, the sons of Korah, what the sons of Korah are saying here is, listen, it doesn't matter who your enemy is. It doesn't matter how dark the sea is right now that is overtaking you. He is sovereign above all rulers and all authorities, and even Mount Hermon can't stand in his presence so you can put your hope in him. 
There's no reason to be downcast. There's no reason to be depressed or discouraged. Put your hope in God. He is the rock. He is the, the salvation and the security. Okay, so, so now the meaning that I understood goes up a notch. And this is what I want you to see. The more we know the author's intended meaning, the more we're going to interpret this thing correctly. And so we need scholars. You actually do need me to spend 20 hours a week studying so that I come up and I, I, I tell you what the Bible says based on study and work so I can feed you what is true. But here's the thing too. Every resource that I have access to, you've got access to. And, and Caleb has built a resource page on our app. If you just go to the Bible page on our app, there are endless resources for you that he has curated so that you can know everything that I know and so that you can see everything that I see. So all I can say is pick it up and read it. Okay, well, let's move on. 1119. All right. Um, Manchester United started in 19 minutes ago, last game of the season. Our interpretation must be done in the context of the passage. So every passage has its own author, audience, setting, occasion, language, genre, and the list goes on and on. If we try to pluck a verse out of its context, I can almost guarantee you 9.99999 times out of 10, you're going to get it wrong. This is why Bible studies are so helpful that, that have like the notes and the, the, the study Bibles, you know what I'm talking about? The thick ones, get the thickest study Bible you can get. You're not gonna bring it to church, it's too heavy. Get the thickest study Bible you can get because when you read it underneath every passage is just a ton of notes giving you the context, letting you know what words mean, showing you what was going on in the first century and, and maybe 600 BC and all this kind of stuff. It's so helpful. One of the resources that we have on our app is called The Bible Project. Tim Mackey is one of those Hebrew scholars. He's one of those Old Testament scholars who's just a beast. And he makes all of these really cool animated videos and he breaks it down for you and you can watch a video in three minutes and it's gonna blow your mind. It's gonna change the way you read the Bible because it's gonna give you context. One illustration of how important context is, is is related to the text of the prodigal son. You know this story and I'm gonna talk fast and I'm gonna fly through it. Um, the prodigal son in Luke 15 uh, there's, there's a detail in that story that most Americans never see. Most Americans never, like when we tell the story of the prodigal son, we almost always leave this out. And it, it's the detail of the famine. So in verse 14, it tells us why the prodigal returned home. And it says that he spent all of his money and then there was a famine that swept the country and so then he returned home. As Americans, we read, he spent all his money and he had nothing left, so he came home. And we just forget about the famine. And so one seminary professor tried to do an experiment to demonstrate how our own context like, hinders the way we read the context of, of the New Testament. And so he asked 100 seminary students to read the story of the prodigal son and focus on every detail and then close the Bible, put it away, and try to retell it, mentioning every single detail that they remembered. 100 students, only six of them remembered the famine. Then he went over to St. Petersburg, Russia, and he did the same thing. And this time he found 50 seminary students in St. Petersburg, Russia, and he told him to do the same thing, read the Bible, close it, and then tell the story with every detail. And every single one of them, except for eight, remembered the famine. Do you know why that was? It was because 70 years earlier, there was a three-year famine in St. Petersburg, and it killed 650,000 people. And so it was a massive part of their culture, and it was a massive part of their imaginations. And so when they read the Bible, the famine is what stood out. Now, this is what's so important. You and I do not approach the Bible as clean slates. We have biases, we have traditions, we have imaginations that are informed by our culture. And if we want to interpret it correctly, we have to do our best to own that and acknowledge it and set those things aside so that we can see it in the context it was written. That makes sense, right? Okay. We've got to get into the world of the writer, finally. You guys are awesome. 
and you've been paying attention so well. We're almost there. Our interpretation must let the clear passages inform the difficult ones. Sorry for that typo. Let the clear passages inform the difficult ones. Can I encourage you with something today? Some of the Bible's hard. And if you think it's hard, you're not alone. In fact, when the apostle Peter was writing his letter to the church at Rome, it's so funny because he's talking about the writings of the apostle Paul and he says, guys, some of it's difficult. (laughs) Some of it's really hard to understand. The apostle Peter said that. So if the apostle Peter is saying that about the Bible, it's okay to say some of it's hard. Um, I go to a passage like Hebrews 6, which talks about people walking away from the faith. And it's very confusing and it's very difficult because it sounds like you can lose your salvation. Hebrews 6 is one of those ones that stumps a lot of people. And yet it's difficult to understand, but here's the principle. When you come to a hard text like Hebrews 6, find the clear texts and use them as commentary. Find the easy text, the explicit text, and let it explain the hard ones. There are so many clear texts about eternal security. There's so many explicit texts about people never losing their salvation. For example, John 5, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice when I call them, and no one the Father has given to me will ever be lost. That's Jesus saying that. You'll never be lost. Romans 8, is another clear one. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And those whom he predestined, he also called and he justified. And those whom he justified, one day he will glorify. And nothing in heaven and on earth, not even yourself, can ever remove you from the love of God. That's as explicit as it gets. So you take the explicit ones. You take the clear ones that like just jump out and smack you in the face. And you take it to the hard ones and you let it interpret itself. That's the principle. You go to the book of James, which we're going to be starting in two weeks. I can't wait. We're going to see a lot of stuff about faith and works. And on the surface, it's a little difficult. It might even lead some people to believe that you are justified by good works. But the explicit teaching from passage after passage is that faith doesn't come by works. Faith is a gift that we receive by grace. Works is the result of it. And so we let the Bible interpret the Bible for us. Listen to this. The more you know of the Bible, the more you'll be able to interpret it correctly. The more you know of the Bible, the more you'll be able to interpret it correctly. It is a virtuous cycle. Listen, the Bible is clear. You can know it. As you read it, you can understand it, and you can know the God who wrote it. As we saw last week, it's what leads to life and wisdom and peace and joy. It is simple enough for a child to grasp, and it is complex enough for the greatest theologian to dive into for the rest of his life and never plumb the depths of it. The most important thing for you and for me is to pick it up and read it. Amen? Okay. Would you bow where you are and pray? Thank the Lord for his word. Thank him that it's clear. Ask the Spirit to illuminate you, to enlighten you so that you can understand it. If you've never believed before and you just have questions and you want to talk, I'd love to talk to you. If you're embarrassed to come and talk to me after this, on our app, you can just respond and say, hey, I'd like to talk to someone and I'll follow up with you. But pray where you are, and then we'll respond in singing together. And we'll go to the table as well.